Welcome to Michael's Record Collection. I'm very happy to have with me from Project drummer Jonathan Mover. Jonathan, thanks for being with me. My pleasure. Thanks for the invitation. So I want to talk to you a little bit about the tour that just ended. Uh, I got to see your show in Sanford, Florida. It was fantastic. I had a great time that night and uh, want to hear all about how the tour went and, and what you know you guys have planned and all of that. But I want to start by asking you how you were first introduced to music. Where did it all start for you? Oh, interesting. Um, I mean, music was in the family. My father was a professional musician um, before he got married and then for a little bit in the early years before the children came. Um, he was a, a horn player, trumpet and trombone, and uh, he played with the Dorsey brothers and Rudy Valley and the Ink Spots and stuff like that. So there was always music in the house. And so that was the given. Um, you know, he was obviously listening to lots of jazz and big band. Um, my mother was also more into classical and she loved gospel. So there was music around all the time. And I had uh, older siblings. So they were the ones who, you know, turned me on more to modern music at the time. Uh, you know, my older brother was listening to the Beatles and Hendrix and uh, the electric flag, um, you know, early Prague. And uh, in particular, uh, Inagata DeVita was what first got me interested in drums. So he was playing the Iron Butterfly record in the house and I heard it. I heard that drum solo, which is an, uh, an incredibly intoxicating solo because of it being a melodic solo. And it's really one of the great drum solos, unlike something that necessarily, let's say like, Carl Palmer would play, which was crazy speed and chops and, and you know, wow. Mm -hmm. Ron Bushy played a melodic solo based on a groove where you could, you know, dig -a -dig -a -dum 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 -dum, that you could remember it like a, like a great, you know, lyric or a great uh, melody. So that's what first got me interested. And I told my parents I wanted to play drums. I was about 10 years old and they signed me up for drum lessons in elementary school. And so, the next thing I knew, you know, I was holding a pair of sticks as big as baseball bats, standing up at a snare drum with, you know, 30 or 40 other kids that couldn't play instruments, trying to play a Sousa march or something. And it was just, it was despicable. It was terrible. <laughs> and I'm, I'm sure I was equally as horrible as they were, but it, it didn't capture my interest at all because I wanted to play a drum kit and play music. Mm -hmm. So uh, I let that go. And the next time around, was when I heard um, Lucky Man on the radio from ELP, mm -hmm. and in particular Keith Emerson's Moog solo at the very end, the outro. I love the sound of it, and um, I asked my parents to buy me the record. They took me to the local record shop, and as we got to the ELP band and started flipping through records, this would have been 1973, 74, somewhere around there, I saw the cover of Brain Salad Surgery. And it didn't matter that Lucky Man wasn't on it. I had to have that record. Yeah. So my parents got it for me. And that was the, you know, the one that flipped open. And you had the poster that came out that you could turn in different ways so that, I don't know if you have it, but the Giger painting was cut out in the middle. Mm -hmm. And you could either see Greg, Carl, or Keith in the middle of it. So it was, you know, pretty captivating. And I listened to the record. And two things were immediately apparent. Um, Carnival 9, first, second, and third impression, especially the third impression. The, the lyric and the story reading about the dystopian future with a robot that takes over, I just was, it just blew my mind. <laughs> and then, of course, hearing the song Takata, which has a drum solo in it that is also incorporates Moog synthesizer drums, that to me was the best of everything. And here I was listening to drums again, but it had the synthesizer in it that, you know, Keith was playing, uh, you know, that I heard in Lucky Man. So that was when drums came around a second time. And, uh, and then from there, I actually got interested in playing. So was Brain Salad Surgery your first favorite album or was there one before that that grabbed you? Um, I, I, yeah, that was probably my first favorite record that I physically, you know, owned and had, and it was mine. Mm -hmm. um, but I would say the other few records that I remember um, vividly uh, were the first few Zeppelins and especially Zeppelin IV, which my brother owned. Um, 
Inagata de Vida, of course, Iron Butterfly, uh, The Beatles, they were always favorites and they are by far my favorite band, you know, hands down. Um, but yeah, my first real record that I owned, which was mine, was Brain Salad. And I want to say my second record was Yes Songs and my third record was In the Court. And from there, it just catapulted into anything and everything prog. Mm -hmm. And that was back in the day where, you know, you could go to a record store and you could flip through the bins, not only look at the cover. So anything that Roger Dean, you know, drew, <laughs> I had to get it, whether the music was good or not. And of course, I'd flip the records over and see who was playing on it. And, you know, anything that Phil Collins played on as a session drummer, of course, I got. Same thing with Bill Bruford, um, Simon Phillips. Steve Gadd, you know, all, all the guys, Terry Bozio. So that's really how physically going to record stores and spending hours thumbing through bins, which was such a fun thing to do, was how my music life, you know, progressed and, and grew. And these guys were your sort of de facto drum teachers because you were largely self-taught. Was that correct? Yeah. Um, you know, early on uh, when my parents, when I did convince my parents a second time around that I wanted to play, um, they did sign me up. Uh, they, a, a neighbor actually gave me a drum kit and I could actually sit down and play uh, at that point. I honestly, I don't think I can tell you why or how, but I did have a four piece uh, pink champagne sparkle Rogers drum kit that a neighbor loaned to me. And the very first song I ever played with headphones on start to finish was Siberian Katru off of Yes Songs. Um, I also remember playing um, to the Who's Next record an awful lot and, and you know, that stuff. So, um, but yeah, that's, that's pretty much how it began, by ear. And then my parents signed me up for drum lessons with a great local teacher in Peabody, Mass, where I'm from. His name is Don Carr. And, you know, he got me into this, you know, holding the sticks correctly and the rudiments and right, left, right, right, and paradiddles and all of that. And at the end of each lesson, um, which is what captured me and, and you know, um, kind of kept me there, was he would let me play to a song at the end of the lesson. And so I would bring my records in and, and play with him. And I, I don't remember how long I stayed with him, but it wasn't very long. And then it was really back to self-taught. And like you just said, all of the drummers that I was into uh, I just bought every record that I could find. And so by that time, I had a big collection of Yes and Genesis and Crimson and ELP. And, you know, uh, Gentle Giant was another really big one. And especially the Jethro Tall Years with Barry Barlow. He was a huge influence on me. And yeah, so that was really, they were all my teachers, uh, you know, and Tony Williams, uh, you know, Billy Cobham, Benny Colliuta, Peter Erskine, Steve Jordan. I mean, I just, I ate them all up. <laughs> Yeah. I'm, I'm glad you brought up Siberian Katru because out of all the Katrus, that's my favorite one. <laughs> and how many Katrus are you familiar with? <laughs> oh, well, let's, we don't have to get into that. But uh, um, you, uh, for a very brief period of time, you joined one of my favorite bands that um, on these shores is quite a bit underrated, and that's Marillion. Mm -hmm. uh, back in about 1983. Um, and this would have been prior to Fugazi? Yes. And uh, so what happened with, with Marillion? I don't know if you want to get into it or not, but uh, ju I'm just curious. Well, um, I've had probably five or six authors, writers in the last decade contact me. You're the only missing link to, you know, the big Marillion story. We know that you played with them and we know that some things, you know, didn't go so well and this, that, and the other thing. And, um, I'm reluctant to tell my side of the story, the truth, you know, as you will, um, you know, just because A, I don't need to stir up anything. Um, B, I don't need to deal with lawyers or a lawsuit, you know, because <laughs> somebody might say, oh, that's not the way I remember it. But I will give you the story because it is a funny story. And um, so basically what happened was I had gone to London shortly after high school um, for two reasons, uh, to pursue my musical, my professional career. I was playing professionally through high school, but, um, you know, I knew that, you know, Jeff Beck wasn't going to call me in Peabody, Massachusetts. 
So I needed to go out and leave home and, and find it for myself. At the time, New York didn't interest me. I had played there quite a few times throughout high school and it was too close to Boston. It didn't seem like that big of an adventure. And LA didn't interest me at all with exception to the fact that Zappa was in LA and that was a dream of mine. Mm -hmm. London really interested me because Simon Phillips at the time and, and still for, for lots of reasons, along with Bill Bruford, Phil Collins, Barry Moore, John Bonham were my favorite drummers. And I loved mostly English progressive rock. Like I said, you know, Zappa, a uh, bit of Todd Rundgren and, you know, the tubes. But for me, it was all English. So I said, I'm going to go over to London and see what I can find. I ended up auditioning for Toya Wilcox. This was way okay. before she was married or anything to do with Robert. She was a singer. And the reason I hooked up with Toya was Simon Phillips had been playing with her a year or so before. So I got to London and I called up the offices. And I said, um, I know that Simon's not with you anymore. And I know Simon and this and that. I'm over from America. And so I auditioned for Toya. Audition went great. And the very next day I got a phone call. And this is funny because it's the, I have good news and bad news has happened three times in my life like this. And, and you'll, you'll appreciate where it comes from. Her manager at the time, I remember her name was Corinne Osborne, called me up and said, um, I spoke to the, to the band and I have good news and bad news. Good news is they really liked your playing. Um, you got the gig. The bad news is we're putting everything on hold for a year because Toya is going to do a movie with Sir Lawrence Olivier, the, the Ebony Tower. So, you know, keep in touch. <laughs> and that was the end of it. So I, I hung around London for a bit. And then, if memory serves me correct, the timeline, I got called to play on Punky Meadows' first solo record. Okay. Yeah. Remember from Angel? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I, I flew back to Boston and we recorded down in Washington, D.C., a Baltimore area. And anyway, a month or two later, I got a phone call from Marillion's manager. Um, I don't know if he still is. His name was John Arneson back at the time. Okay. So I get this phone call and it was basically, uh, we're looking for a drummer and we've gone through a bunch. Your name has come up through nick tauber who was the was nick tauber? yeah the engineer slash producer working with marillion who had also worked with toya so the bass player phil spaulding in toya told nick oh there's a young american drummer that played with toya a few months ago you know he can do all the odd time and this and that why don't you give him a call so they called me up and i said uh, yeah i'm interested so hold right there now let's go back three months, four months, whatever it was, six months before when I was in London with Toya. So I go into an hour price record store. This was like the little local record shop all over, all over London. And I walk in, I'm 18, 19 years old, and I said, I'm really into English progressive rock. Genesis, Jungle Giant, yes, ELP. Is there anything here in England that you guys have that I wouldn't know about in America? So the guy behind the counter says, oh, yeah, you've got to hear Marillion if you like Genesis and Peter Gabriel. So he gave me script for adjusted tier, a uh, script for adjusted tier, and he gave me one or two EPs. And one of them had a song called Grendel on it. Mm -hmm. and the other one may have had Market Square Heroes or they could have been the same one. Anyway, I didn't have a record player with me, but I bought them and uh, put them in my bag and then took them home a month later when I went to record with Punky. And then I put them on my record player and I hated them. <laughs> I thought that they were the worst Genesis clone band ever. And, and the drummer was terrible. Um, Mick Pointer is the drummer. He was yeah. a good player. So I, I, I paid no attention to Marillion and I put them on the shelf and I said, oh, that's five pounds wasted. Okay. So now, you know, Arneson calls me up and uh, would you like to, you know, uh, audition for Marillion? And I said, oh, yeah, I've got the records. I love you guys. I'm totally into it. <laughs> no. and, and he says to me, we're going to be, we, Marillion is opening up for Rush in New York City for a few nights at Radio City. Uh, would you, you know, come down and meet the band and, and everything? So I fly down to New York and I go see them open for Rush. And they get booed off the stage. And, <laughs> and, you know, people are throwing stuff at Fish because they just don't like him and, his, you know, the grease paint and all that. But what I will say is 
they were really good. And they were really good because they were playing with a good drummer. His name is John Martyr, M-A-R-T-Y-R, mm -hmm. maybe, or something like that. And um, I don't know why he didn't join the band, but hearing their music from the script record played in time and played well with a great backbeat, all of a sudden it was like, wow, this music actually isn't too bad. So I met them after the show. We all got along really great. And they said, we'd love you to come to London and audition in like, you know, two weeks or a month, whenever it was. So I flew over and um, they were auditioning for two days and they auditioned about, you know, eight or 10 guys each day, you know, it was a handful. So I went, I think they were auditioning at Nomis. And I went down on the first day to introduce and say hi and tell them that I was there. And, you know, I listened to, maybe you know four three or four guys for a few hours and not one drummer that came in could play one song without fucking up and uh, oh sorry without <laughs> no you know, losing losing the simple odd time that they were and i recognized you know they're playing script they're playing garden party and you know three four measures in oops stop start again and then you know they would play a few riffs that i never heard of before and nobody could play it but each guy got about an hour and so I left, you know, halfway through the day and I said, I'll be back tomorrow at 11 a.m. That was my call spot. And I go in and we play script. We play garden party. We played one more, whatever it was. And then they threw out a couple of new riffs and, uh, and they said, you know, thanks a lot. You know, um, uh, come back, you know, later at six o'clock or something. And I walked out like with my tail between my legs. I, I couldn't understand why every drummer got an hour. And I got 15 minutes and I figured I blew it and I didn't know why. So I, it was a Wednesday. I came back Wednesday at 6 p.m. and they offered me the gig. And then they said, we're doing a live radio program in Germany Friday night that um, would you like to come and do it? No rehearsals, no nothing. <laughs> and I said, absolutely. So I jumped on a flight with them Thursday. I listened with a, I had an old cassette Sony Walkman. And I uh, listened to as much material as I could. And we did the next night, which was live in, in, in Bonnetal, Germany. Um, and then we got back to London. And they wanted, like a week later, we were, they were going to Rockfield in Wales to start writing and rehearsing Fugazi, what was to be Fugazi. So I didn't have time to go back to America and pack my clothing or anything. I just stayed there. And I stayed with Fish. I actually, you know, slept on his kitchen floor in a sleeping bag or something for, you know, a week or, or two. And um, we moseyed around London together and we got pretty tight and it was a great um, situation. We went to uh, Wales. First tune that we wrote was based on a riff that I came up with, which turned into Punch and Judy. Mm -hmm. and we demoed it up. And then we did a song called Incubus which was also kind of based around this tribal beat that I was doing, which was a linear groove around the kit that, um, that I was playing. And then we did a song called Jigsaw. And then we were playing Assassin, which they had already written. And, um, you know, for various reasons um, that I won't get into, a uh, fish just snapped on me one night. And, and in front of all the guys, I went into a, a set a few things to me that were not acceptable to me. And even though he was a foot and a half taller than me and 200 pounds heavier than me, I was ready to go after him. And the guys, you know, pulled us apart. And then the three of them looked at me and said, we have no idea where that came from. Why would he say things like that? What happened? And I had no idea. Yeah. The next morning I woke up and there was a, uh, you know, there was a, a car coming for me to take me back to London. And, um, said goodbye to the to the three uh the three blind mice and um and then as i was getting into the car fish came out and um and he he grabs my hand and he looks at me and he says i know you don't understand this now but it'll all make sense one day and i'm sorry and in my hand he puts his fish earring the one that he was very famous for yeah and um and i got into the car and that was the end of marillion for the most part 
and I still have the earring. <laughs> um, every time I see him, he asks for it back, and I refuse to give it to him. <laughs> Maybe one day, but uh, and you know, we've said hello a few times through the years. We've bumped into each other, and um, yeah, and that, uh, that's that's pretty much it. I mean, and you know, it was the first time I saw them afterwards. Actually, I didn't see the whole band. I saw Fish and I saw Ian. And they came to see GTR play at the Hammersmith Odeon. And, you know, Fish cornered me and he said, you know, uh, you need to stop saying the things that you're saying about what happened. And I said, why? I'm just telling the truth. Are you ashamed of it? Are you, you know, you got a problem with it? And and at that point, I just said, I don't have anything to say anymore anyway. You know, the truth is out. Leave it at that. And then Ian comes up to me and says, um, you got to stop telling people that I'm playing your parts on the record. And I said, but you are. <laughs> I have the demo. I have the first four songs that I recorded. You're playing my, my grooves and my fills note for note. You know, give me a break. And I just walked away. You know, that's pretty much it. Yeah. But I, but I, I must admit, you know, <clears throat> I wasn't a fan of their music, you know, because I liked it more when I was playing it, and I enjoyed going to Germany with them, and I'm grateful that Fish had a fallout with me because I'm very happy with the paths that my career took, you know, playing with Aretha Franklin and Joe Satriani and everybody mm -hmm. in GDR. Um, but it, it was quite a learning experience. It was one of those situations where, um, you know, it was like right away the best and worst of everything. And, <laughs> um, yeah, but it was what it was, and it, yeah. it all worked out fine. Yeah, so you got you got that writing credit on the album for um, Punch and Judy, one of I my favorite. Writing, yes, I, I got the minimal of whatever <laughs> they could give me. Uh -huh. I worked on Incubus and Jigsaw, too. They did not recognize that. Um, and I never got paid. So the red and credit is nothing but ink on a paper. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Jigsaw and, for what it's worth, Jigsaw and Punch and Judy are my favorite songs on the album. So, uh, Cool. Yeah, Punch um, was, and I love the outro to Jigsaw. I really thought that mm -hmm. was um, was really nice. But yeah, anyway. So you, you talked about GTR. You went, uh, how did you get involved with Steve Hackett and Steve Howe and, and found that? You talked about Phil Spaulding. Obviously, you right. had a history with him, uh, yeah. so you were able to bring him into the fold. But uh, but how'd you get with the Steves? So this is the next, I have good news, bad news story. <laughs> so, um, so, you know, I, I, I go back to the States again after Marillion and, uh, you know, just to regroup and really process what had happened. And thinking, you know, do I do I go to New York now? Do I go to L.A.? Um, and I decided, no, I want to go back to London because I still had more to pursue there. So I went back very quickly after. And and then I found that Ian Mosley, who I believe was considered in the beginning when I auditioned, ended up playing with them. They called him after I was fired. And so I said, OK, well. Hackett must need a drummer now because Ian's joined Marillion. And I was a big fan of, of Hackett's solo material. Um, you know, Voyage of the Acolyte was great. And Highly Strung was the last one that he had done, which also had some great stuff that Ian was on. So I called up Steve's manager. I'm not remembering his name at the time uh, right now. And, uh, and I said, oh, you know, my name is Jonathan Mover, American drummer living in London. Um, I was just playing in Marillion. And I heard that Ian is now with Marillion. So I'm assuming Steve needs a drummer. I'd love to audition. And he literally says to me, you just missed it. Steve found a drummer yesterday. They've been auditioning for a couple of weeks. And sorry, better, not, better luck next time. So I hung up the phone. And five minutes later, I called him back. And I said, do me a favor. Please call Steve Hackett and tell him to give me an hour in a rehearsal room. If I get the gig, he pays for the room. And if I don't get the gig, I'll pay for the room. He said, okay. So I hung up the phone. He called me back five minutes later. And he said, Steve Hackett says you have big balls. And <laughs> see you tomorrow at noon at wherever it was. So I went in and um, we played one of, I don't remember the names of the songs, but the first thing we played was in like 13, 16 and um i played it right away and then we started jamming and after like literally five minutes he just said you know the gig is yours 
And so that's how we got together with Hackett. And this this is the this is the this is great. So this is maybe you know two weeks before Christmas of I guess it's 83. Yeah, 83. And Steve invites me to a party at his house when he was living in Richmond. And at the party is Mike Rutherford, Tony Banks, and Chester Thompson. And wow. I'm 19, I think, you know, 18 and a half, 19. I'm out of my mind. I can't believe it. Sure. You know, Small, <laughs> Small Creeps Day is one of my favorite, you know, records ever. And, you know, Tony Banks, I love his playing. And I had The Fugitive and Steve Gadd. So I meet everybody and I'm like, oh, my God, I'm really, my road to fame is paved once again. <laughs> and so I have a wonderful, you know, hang. And I was, and we were supposed to, the reason I got hired by Hackett was he had a European and an English tour set up with his band at the time that had Nick and Chaz in it. And then we were going to do a record the next summer. So go to the party, meet the gods. And then like three or four days, a week later, Hackett calls me up and he says, I have good news and bad news. <laughs> I said, <laughs> okay, give me the bad news first. Well, the bad news is I'm disbanding. So there's no tour, there's no record, blah, blah, blah. I said, oh, great. What's the good news? I met Steve Hackett. Um, I met Steve Howe. We had a chat about doing a super group based on two guitars, and we want you to play drums. Okay. So Hackett, Howe, and I got together first for about a few weeks to a month, and we started recording and demoing all of these riffs and ideas. And I think we started auditioning bass players first. And uh, we went through a few guys and nobody cut it. And I kept on saying, you got to check out this guy, Phil Spaulding, you know. And um, so then Phil came in and auditioned and like that, he just took the gig. I mean, he's just amazing. Mm -hmm. After that, um, I think, I don't remember if we had any other vocalists. I only do, honestly don't remember, but it was Steve Hackett's connection to Max Bacon from a band that, that Hackett guested on that Max was singing in and Max came down and, and completed the band. And that was, that's how GTR came about. It was a great band. It's a shame that only one album came of that. Um, it was, it, it was a great band, but you don't know how great it was. The original material that we had demoed and, and recorded and everything was very much along the lines of the pro more progressive side of of mid mid era genesis and yes mm -hmm. um the biggest mistake we made in my opinion was going with jeff downs as a producer not because jeff downs can or cannot produce but jeff downs had convinced himself and other people that he was the equal to trevor horn <laughs> and that what trevor horn had done to you know 90125 and, and everybody everybody else they worked with everybody well i shouldn't say everybody but i think the two steves were somehow convinced that we could be the new asia and make a pop band out of progressive rock players and sell five or six million like asia did and it, it ruined the record not only was the record stripped down of a lot of the heavy prog that we had already recorded for it but the mixes are bathed in so much reverb that you can barely hear what's going on so it's a shame that nobody heard the real gtr and even though it sold about a million and we had a fairly successful tour, um, the process of working with Jeff in the studio was not a pleasant one. And, and you know, within like two or three weeks, the Steve stopped, the Steves stopped speaking to each other. And, um, you know, it wasn't meant to last, unfortunately. Yeah. Well, it's too bad. Um, You've had a great career. I want to get to the project stuff, so I'm just going to kind of gloss over a little bit. You played with mm -hmm. Joe Satriani, you mentioned. Um, you spent some time in Moscow working with mm -hmm. some Russian bands. That must yeah. have been kind of a, a crazy time in your life from 89 to 93. Yeah, it was pretty insane. I was over there right when, you know, the wall came down and, and the curtain opened up and the coup happened. I was in Red Square when the coup happened in April of 90, I think it was. Um, basically, the short story is in um, in the summer of 89, I toured the Soviet Union and an extensive tour with a South African band called Scully. And the leader of that band is Blondie Chaplin, who went on to sing with the Stones. Um, and before Scully, he was in the Beach Boys. So I got the gig subbing for Anton Fig, who's South African. So he was the member of the band, but he couldn't leave Letterman to go do a tour. Mm -hmm. So I auditioned. 
And I uh, went to the Soviet Union for about three months, had the time of my life and, you know, met a lot of people in music and managers and stuff like that. And I made friends with so many people that once we got back to the States, um, I just started getting calls saying, you know, could you come back over? Could we do this? Could we do that? Could you produce? And so I spent about a year going back and forth and then ended up teaming teaming up with one manager in particular who was hiring me for a lot of stuff. So I, I got an apartment over there and I got a visa where I could fly back and forth whenever I wanted to. And um, I really, really enjoyed my time there. It was an amazing, wonderful, once in a lifetime experience. And so I was back and forth quite a bit between 89 and 93. Oh, sounds amazing. You, uh, you, but you've had an amazing career. You've, you've toured with Saigon Kick, The Tubes, mm -hmm. Alice Cooper you've worked with. Um, are you known more in the industry as a touring drummer than a recording drummer? I'm known more as a freelance drummer uh, for either or. I would say I'm known probably more for touring because of the people I played with. You know, like you said, Alice and Joe, and I spent five years playing with Aretha Franklin, which, mm -hmm. which brought me a lot of notoriety. Um, but a lot of the studio work I've done has been as a ghost drummer where, you know, you, the drummer's in the band, but he's not playing well or he can't play to a click or something. And then the producer calls in a drummer that doesn't get, you know, credit or gets buried in the credits. Yeah. So um, I've done a lot of records that some people know I'm on and most people don't. Uh, it's funny because it, it just came up. I'm not on social media an awful lot, but I do have Facebook. And if somebody mentions my name about something, you know, I get a, uh, my phone says, oh, you've been tagged or named in something. Yeah. And there was a, one of my dear friends who, who I love him is Brett Scallion, the lead singer of Fuel, um, if you know Fuel. Yeah. And so I, I played, I worked on three of the four Fuel records, which most people don't know. And so I'm completely on the first record. There's, there's not, nothing that was hit on a drum kit or, or anything on that first record. That's not me. I did all of it. But um, there's a different person credited in his photos on the record. And so I got a tag in this thing and I read it. And it was somebody writing to Brett, communicating on Facebook that says, you know, this, that, and the other thing. And I love the drums on Fuel and didn't such and such play so well. And, and Brett, you know, wrote back and said, actually, that's Jonathan Mover on the first Fuel record entirely. And got to give credit to my bro. A lot of people don't know it, but he was the ghost drummer on the record. So I would say yes to your question, but um, there are a handful of producers that fortunately, you know, call me when they need me to do something, but not always do I get a credit. Yeah. Um, so let's get into Project. You, uh, you put together this band uh, to play classic prog rock songs. Mm -hmm. What was the impetus for that? The musical box was the impetus, the, the Genesis oh. tribute band. Yeah. So um, three years ago, about right now, um, I think it was February because it was winter and it's pretty cold. Uh, I had just flown from Boston, where my mother was, to Los Angeles on a Tuesday morning. And Tuesday late afternoon, early evening, I got a text message from a friend of mine who's very well known in the drum industry saying, um, would you be available or interested in touring with the musical box? They were a Genesis tribute band. I didn't really know much about them, but I knew who they were. And I said, uh, yeah, sure. If I've got time, you know, give them my name and number and tell them to give me a call. And that was the end of it. So an hour later, Sebastian calls me up, the, the, uh, the bass player and the leader of the band. And he says, uh, you know, in his French accent, uh, oh, Monsieur Mouva, we're very excited to play with you. You know, we, uh, we've all seen you with different people, and this is an honor. And I said, yeah, you know, um, just, I'm interested. Send me your set list, send me your schedule, and then we'll, I'll see what I can do. And he basically says, forget the set list. The schedule is tomorrow. <laughs> and I said, you got to be kidding. Where? When? New Hampshire. And I said, oh, my God, I just flew across America six hours ago. I could have just, you know, I could have stayed there. Um, anyway, I flew back the next day and I met them like an hour or two before the gig. No rehearsals or anything. Uh -huh. And with exception to some of the medleys that they put together that they had to explain and we ran through very quickly at Soundcheck, I just winged it. But the most amazing thing happened. Um, which was literally uh, within the first 
minute that we got on stage and I was playing, I, uh, I don't remember, oh, 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 it was um, Slumbers in, in That Quiet Earth, Wind and Mother, okay. one yep. of my favorites. And, dun, 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 and I'm playing the thing in three and I became 15 years old again. <laughs> I, I literally went right back to my childhood in my basement of my parents' house in Tibbity Mass with headphones on and my record player behind me, dreaming of being Chester next to Phil, you know, or something like that. Sure. And so I, I, I loved playing with them and it really brought back this, you know, it relit the fire that was in me 45 years ago. Um, and so I did a couple of weeks with them um, and they are really, really great guys. I, I enjoyed every second with them, but I will be honest in saying it wasn't the gig for me. And the reason it wasn't the gig for me, respectfully to them, is they were trying to emulate everything that they that the guys played on the record. Mm -hmm. And that wasn't me. And that's not me. Yeah. You know, I, I wouldn't want to be in a tribute band to do that. So I call Project an homage band. Yeah. We're paying tribute to a genre, but we're not copying anything exact. So after like three or four gigs and it was a lot of material and and new shit flying at me you know all the time we we're in the we we're in the car one day driving from one you know gig to another and sebastian says you know it's, it's amazing we can't believe what you're doing and we're so happy and you know but in firth of fifth when it goes in the in the 18th measure when it goes from this to this um, Phil plays the 14 inch floor tom and then the 12 inch rap tom before he hits the hi hat. And, and you're kind of doing this. And I didn't know if he was joking or not. Anyway, you know, he was serious. He wanted me to go back and start listening now each night after a gig to all the particulars of what Phil had done on the record. And that just wasn't for me. You know, and, uh, I was there to get them through their tour until their drummer got his visa. And at that point, it started to, dare I say, get a little less enjoyable. Yeah. You know? And the other thing was, um, I was much more into seconds out when I was a kid. That's what I was practicing to most of the time before I started getting into selling England and trick. I was playing all the live versions. And so I was also very familiar with Chester's parts more than Phil. So mm -hmm. I would be doing a lot of Chester stuff with them, but they wanted these studio versions. And, you know, uh, it was a two and a half or three hour show. And that's a lot of brain cells. And I was just <laughs> grateful that I could play all the stuff, let alone forget, every, and, you know, let alone learn every, every lick. So yeah. anyway, after a couple of weeks, um, a, another guy that, that wanted to play every lick and had been ready to play every lick came out and continued and i went to see them in la it was great i really enjoyed it so i i have them to thank and i'm very very grateful that i had that experience because i got back to la and i was really feeling a void i i i knew i was having fun but i didn't realize how fulfilled i was mm -hmm. and so i said to myself you know two things how do i continue this love affair because I was in love with playing drums and playing prog again. And how can I do this and not limit it to one band? Because I don't want to do a tribute gig. Yeah. And that's I just literally said, I want to do a, a tribute to a genre, an homage band. But I also want to do it with stellar musicians. You know, there's a lot of great tribute bands out there. But, you know, they're, they're very good musicians with an excellent visual show. But I really can't say that I've gone out and I've seen anybody that can play as good as the bands that they're emulating. Yeah. And I really wanted to do that. And so um, uh, as quickly as I can tell you, the, the day that I was back thinking about this was a Friday night and I was going to see Brand X in Pasadena because I had played with Percy in New York about 20 years before and I hadn't seen him since. And mm -hmm. I wanted to see the new drummer that they had who was fantastic. And um, is that so, where you is that where you ran into Rio? Rio mentioned yeah. after the show that yeah. he ran into you at a gig. <laughs> he was literally I. But this is a crazy story. I'm at dinner um, before we're going to Brand X. So it's like seven o'clock at night. We're going to go to Brand X at nine. Mm -hmm. I'm sitting at dinner. I'm, I'm with a guitar player friend of mine who lives in L.A. And I said, I got this idea. What do you think? And do you know anybody? He goes, you know, I just did a gig a few weeks ago with this keyboard player, Rio Akimoto from Spock's Beard. 
And I said, oh, I, I don't know him. And like the musical box, I've heard of Sparks Beard, but I'm not that familiar. So he texted Rio. And Rio writes back immediately, give Jonathan my number. I'm very interested. All right, great. And then the second guy, he says, and for guitar, what about Mike Keneally? And Eric and myself, just a few months before, had gone to see Satriani downtown in L.A. And Mike was playing with him. So I just said, oh, Mike won't be available. He's not going to be interested in this. We no sooner finished dinner, walked to get into line at Brand X, and Rio is standing in front of me. <laughs> so we met. We hit it off right away, and he said, count me in. About a week later, I was back in uh, Boston visiting my mother, and after the musical box show that we played in New Hampshire, I was invited to be interviewed by Alan Bacheleron from um, New Ears. He's got a prog podcast. Okay. And so he interviewed me in the studio, and at the end of the interview, when we were offline, I said, hey, I've got this idea. I've got a keyboard player. I'm thinking about guitar players. Do you know a bassist? Do you know a singer? And uh, he mentioned Matt and gave me Matt's number. And then he mentioned Michael Sadler. And I said, oh, like Keneally, Sadler's busy with Saga. He's not going to be interested in this. So I get back to L.A. I call Matt and Matt's interested. And then Alan calls me a few days later and says, I spoke to Sadler and give him a call. He's interested. It was literally as easy as that. And then, of course, Keneally came into play we got, we started rehearsing with a couple of different guitar players that we were checking out. Nobody really fit the bill perfectly, but we were at least moving forward. And then my friend Jason Bieler from Saigon Kick stepped in so that we could get some video and we could get some promo done and launch the website. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and that was while we were still looking for a permanent full-time guy in L.A. And then sure enough, by way of a few different channels, Kenny became available and uh, said, sign me up. And that yeah. was it. Tremendous. I had Michael on the show before you guys uh, were out on the road and he was very excited about it. He told me about, you know, he had a, he had a very similar um, reaction to progressive rock back in the day. And he mentioned, he, he mentioned gentle giant yep. and um, he wouldn't tell me what you guys were going to play. He said, we're going to play a gentle giant song, but he right. kept it a secret. And I got to say, I, I probably would have guessed 50 songs before I guessed the, the one that you guys picked two weeks in Spain. Yeah, you know, it's, I, I had chosen, at this point, I had chosen all the, the music. I had a list of everything. I put the medleys together into Pro Tools. I assembled all of it, and I sent everything out to everybody. And um, everybody loved what I did. A couple of comments came in, like, I on a list I had Squonk listed, and it was a maybe. And Michael said, absolutely. It's one of my favorite tunes. I must do Squawk. Great. And then for UK, I think I had Presto Vivace or In the Dead of Night. And it was Rio and Michael that both said, we'd like to do Rendezvous. And so I said, well, I'd love to, but how about if we do a different version of it? And that's when Michael said, there's a great acoustic thing that, that Wetton did. Um, but the funny thing about two weeks is I saw Gentle Giant when I was a kid twice. They were mind blowing and they are one of my favorite bands. And although I love all of their music, you know, just the same and, and proclamation and, and, you know, uh, power and glory, everything, they, their stuff is incredible. When I picked up the Missing Peace record, the melody of Two Weeks in Spain just hit me over the head and I like never recovered from it. <laughs> and so I've always wanted to play it. And when I when they saw it on the paper, everybody said, yeah, that'd be really great. So that being said, though, we are getting ready with some other Gentle Giant uh, a little bit earlier and more progressive. Nice. Um, yeah. I had Ray Shulman on the show. Um, and I honestly didn't know how that would be received because... Gentle Giant wasn't really huge in this country, and that's where most of my listeners are. And uh, it's easily my most downloaded show. Easily. Oh, that's great. They deserve it because they are the unsung heroes of Prague, you know. And, and not only was their music fantastic, I mean, their compositions and arrangements were amazing, but they all played their asses off. I mean, you know, I've seen all of my favorite prog bands. And Genesis, by far, is one of the best bands live. Everybody in Genesis, in every format, format that they had, can play. Yes, I've seen good and bad. ELP, I've seen good and bad, you know. Mm -hmm. um, Gentle Giant, flawless. 
So those guys are the real deal, and it's a shame. I think they were too good for this country, if you know what I mean, yeah. because when you think about Yes and Genesis and ELP, when they got really big, it was because of their pops, their more popular stuff got them big, and then other people gravitated to what they did. I don't think Gentle Giant had a chance because they were just too good and too beyond the average listener. I but, think there's a. I think that in this country there's a tendency to assume – that everything needs to be dumbed down to the least common denominator for anything to be popular. Like nothing could just stand on its own, but yet history shows a little bit differently. When you think back to the eighties, when MTV came out, uh, the bands that were on MTV, they would just take any video because they needed to fill their 24 hours, seven days a week. And there were all kinds mm. of variety in, in what they played. And a lot of those bands hit it very big. You had, you know, Madness was doing ska and nobody was doing ska popularly in this country. And, and like everything worked. And I think that if people would have just given human beings more credit in this country, I think bands like Gentle Giant could have been bigger here. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think if, if there was a, a conduit to get to people like there was with MTV outside of radio, um, they probably would have and quite a few other bands. Um, you know, visually, people took in video before they even liked the song. There are a lot of times people recognize the video but didn't remember the tune. Then they'd hear the song on the radio and they wouldn't even realize it was the same video that they that they loved, you know. So, yeah, I suppose, you know, Gentle Giant may have had a better chance if, if MTV was out in the 70s. But fortunately, mm -hmm. you know, people like us got <laughs> to get into it because, man, do I love them. Yeah. If you were if you were staying up late, though, in the uh, the in the FM radio era before the same three or four companies bought all the radio stations and homogenized everything, yeah. you heard just amazing stuff, just all ends of the spectrum. Yeah. I remember, and, yeah. In, in Boston, we had a small station called WFNX, the Phoenix. And I remember getting turned on to Steve Hillage, Bebop Deluxe. I heard the Utopia Raw record on on there you know and and that was a great opportunity but you know just like with mtv and and 80s format everything then became format and formula and they were told you can only play this because this is what sells and this is who's going to advertise and if you don't play it we're not going to get the money and it's the vicious circle yeah exactly yeah so you guys did about 20 or so shows across the country this spring from california to florida from your perspective how did it go from both a musical and a success standpoint um incredibly well on both um we it went better than we expected not only did were we received uh, very well and wonderfully by all of the audiences it was it was really overwhelming i mean with stand multiple standing ovations every night and um, just, you know, people loving the experience as much as we loved playing it. You know, they were into listening and, and seeing it. So that was great. We got invited back by every venue um, at the end of the night, you know, and we knew that some places were going to be light. You know, COVID was still a factor. We had a lot of places saying, you know, thank you for playing because we can't book anybody and we want people to know that, you know, we're safe and, and come out, uh, which by the way, we did a month on the road with nine guys in a bus and nobody got COVID. So, you know, we wore masks and we were careful, uh, but we got invitations back from every venue. Every promoter was very pleased and musically it just got better and better every night. And uh, you, so you went to Tuffy's, yes, which was one of the last gigs that we were able to get. It was literally a night that was open that we tried to fill and somebody recommended it to us. And they said to us, it's gonna be a lousy gig. It's a bar, it's not a big stage, you know, it's gonna be like a hundred people max or whatever. But, you know, instead of having a day off, why don't you do it? And we said, yeah, you know, of course. That gig was phenomenal. It was, the band played really well that night. The audience, yeah. where you were there, was wonderful. It was a bar, but it was a great bar. We would go back and play it again. So we didn't have a bad night. We really didn't. And I mean, the band just 
came together better and better right from the first gig, but we got tighter and more connected with each other uh, the more we went on. And by the last show that we played, which was that sold out a thousand people for the Cruise to the Edge um, concert before they, they, uh, they left shore, was just amazing. What a high note to end on. And uh, it, it exceeded everything. And we made money, which no band does on their first tour. And we made good money. Good. Everybody's happy. It was a success all around and, and uh, you know, just paving the way for the future. I'm glad to hear that. Yeah, the Tuffy show was, I'm glad you, you uh, added that one. I was, uh, I had a conflict the night you were over in um, St. Petersburg, I think. Uh, it was where I you were. The Largo show. Yeah, Largo, that's it. Um, I've, I've been to that, I've been to that, uh, uh, that, venue before and it's a it's a great place yeah. um and i enjoyed it they they have a lot of prog acts there um mm -hmm. one of the few area uh, places that have a lot of prog acts but i was going i was committed to go and see the canals uh who have like not toured in 20 years <laughs> they were going to be in in tampa the same night yeah. okay they got COVID, or at least some people in their party did so mm -hmm. um i would have been heartbroken um trying to scramble and get over there for that sh for your show but i got to see you here which was it's less than 10 minutes from my house and it is it is a cool little setup it's uh it's it's a bar but in the back they've got sort of their own like little building and it's just just for music and i thought the acoustics were pretty good i thought the sound was good it was a very good sound um and uh, and it was a great gig. We you know that we they treated us wonderfully. We had a great time, and we we all finished the show saying, "Man, that was a hell of a lot better than we were told it was going to be." I thought it was going to be. Yeah, but it was. was um, we played there. Several standing ovations. Um, the Rush medley got everybody up on their feet. Of course, some some yes and some uh, uh, Pink Floyd and all of that. Uh, Genesis. Everybody's. It's just so good to see these these songs get played live by by very good musicians. Um, you know, a lot of talent on that stage, and you guys were gracious enough to come out and shake hands and say hello after the show, which uh, I'm sure everybody will remember that. I, I saw I saw uh, Saga fans gushing up to Michael afterwards, and um, you know, Spock's Beard fans gushing uh, with Rio, and everybody talking to you and, and Matt, and everybody, and, and Mike. It's uh, been a while since I've seen Mike uh, live, so it was nice to say hello to him. And uh, it was just, uh, I think the experience of seeing you guys, it's its unlike, I've been to tribute bands, and mm -hmm. uh, and I've, I've been to those types of shows and, and reenactment shows and that kind of thing, and I've seen the originals in a lot of these cases. And it's just nice to see this type of music played by skilled musicians who love it as much as the audience does. And what's so cool about it, because you mentioned, like, you know, we come out and spend time with the fans. What's really great is with fans, too. So, you know, when, when we come out and talk to people and somebody comes up and says, um, oh, man, I can't believe you played Carnival 9 the entire first print press, blah, blah, blah. I say, yeah, wasn't that great? Because I always loved what Carl was doing. Or, you know, I changed this part and it's so exciting. And we all feel that way. We're such fans of the music that we're playing which is very different from, you know, me playing with Sacriani or Alice Cooper, you know, coming off the stage and, and having somebody saying, you know, oh man, your drum solo is amazing. Or I love, you know, the single kick line that you do in Hordes of Locusts or something like that. I'm very appreciative to it. I, I love it. And it's very nice to, you know, to be, um, you know, recognized for it. But it's different playing this stuff because I'm such a huge fan of all the music that I can relate to them being excited about it as well because yeah. I'm so excited to play it and the other guys feel the same way. Yeah, it was nice to see everybody kind of lighting up uh, at the mention of, uh, you know, when you guys played, um, you know, Lark's Tongue or whatever, you know, everybody, you know, the, the eyes of the musicians who played it getting big and, and being fanboys with us. That was a very mm -hmm. unique uh, experience. Yeah, you, you, you can't wipe the smiles off our faces. And it's funny because, you know, I've been playing drums professionally 45 plus years, and I have so many friends that have seen me play in every, with everybody I've played with. And everybody said to me, we've never seen you smile like this when you play. You know, you don't look unhappy when you're playing, but this was just, you know, 
grinning ear yeah. to ear. I, I can't help it. It's just, it, it's so great. You guys um, all were smiling all night long. It was great to see. Yeah. What was the biggest obstacle the band had to overcome while on the road? Well, aside from catching COVID, yeah, yeah. Um, the biggest obstacle, getting bounced around in the back of the bus, trying to get sleep in a bumpy ride. Um, yeah, you know, it was pretty smooth. Uh, not the driving. I mean, not, not the bus <laughs> ride. The bus ride is a bus ride. But um, we really didn't, you know, hit any real bumps. Um, you know, we were tired here and there because we covered a lot of ground. But we didn't have any mishaps of equipment. Um, nobody got hurt or anything like that, other than a couple of blisters and whatever. Um, yeah, we, we really didn't have any problems. I saw your pictures on Facebook, and I, I have to say the pictures from inside the vehicle make it look bigger than what it looked like on the outside when I saw it. Oh, you're not kidding. Yeah, and, and <laughs> it, yeah, it, it would actually, it's not a bus, it's a bandwagon. Yeah. And so basically, you know, we tried to get a bus, but because of COVID and for various reasons, the price of a bus now is like three or four times what it was three years ago. Wow. And it was just not possible. So mm -hmm. we were going to go out with a luxury sprinter and a trailer and just have a driver and go with hotel rooms. And a buddy of mine, uh, actually the same guitar player that recommended Rio and Keneally, uh, he used to play guitar for Aaron Carter. And he said, you know, why don't you check on a bandwagon? Uh, what's a bandwagon? Oh, it's, it's a truck made into, uh, let me, yep. it's a truck made into a mini bus. And, uh, you know, it's got a tiny kitchen, but it's got a bathroom and a shower. And, you know, it's not as luxurious, as luxurious as a bus, but it's, you know, it's luxury anyway. So I called a bandwagon and they said, oh, we're completely sold out for, you know, April, but we'll put you on a waiting list and you can secure it for the, for the August, September, October dates. And then sadly, uh, you know, the Russia Ukraine incident, you know, came up like a week or two later mm -hmm. and whether it was because of oil prices, because gasoline went through the roof yeah. or maybe some bands were coming over from Europe and canceled, but they called me back and they said, we have one if you want it. So we took it. And the guys loved it. Everybody was very happy on it. And we'll most likely do it again in the fall. Nice. Yeah. So what is the prospect of a project live CD or DVD? Um, I would say more than likely, um, after we get a few more, you know, tunes in the repertoire, and we've got a lot more to choose from, which would be the fall and into next year. More than likely, we'll, we'll, we'll probably have a DVD CD available. Um, everybody's asking for it, and yeah. it makes sense. Um, so we probably will. Okay. Yeah. The um, I'm sure the suggestions were probably flying on the uh, on the bandwagon about what are we going to do next time out. I mean, uh, material wise. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, um, we've been talking about it. I, I got to tell you, I'm I'm so lucky with these guys because you know, even though it's my band, and you know, I, I put it together and I and I started the funding to get us going. Um, I'm open to all suggestions, and we talk about lots of stuff. And you know, we do rearrangements and whatever. If somebody comes up with a better idea, we go for it. But each time I brought up tunes and, and this and that, everybody just says, yeah, I'll, great, send it, let's do it. <laughs> so the next four tunes that we're ready to start tackling later this month, I just suggested them and everybody said, absolutely, let's do it. So, so far, so good, you know? No, no arguments. You guys all love the same music. That's great. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it, there's, there's no shortage of great songs to play. And I think everybody's looking forward to a lot of tours because we do want to play all of these different tunes and, and have extras that we can swap out. You know, on this tour, we did New York City two nights in a row, and then we did two shows in Boca back to back. And so we had to swap around a little bit and do shorter sets. And so having the extra material will be great for that, for, you know, the future when we do multiple nights. And... Not only would, do we want to play more material, but it also gives, you know, the, um, the audience a reason to come back and, and, and hear and see new things. Yeah. And so we're ready. Great. The, um, 
uh, the fall plans. I know you have um, a, a makeup date. I think this was the Chicago date that was canceled or postponed. Yeah, yeah. we have a makeup. Yeah, the plan right now is to do the West Coast and hopefully a bit of the Pacific Northwest in the beginning of August. We're just starting to book the dates now. And then August 24th until October 9th, we're looking to go back out across the country and cover more ground. You know, okay. so, uh, yeah, that's the plan right now. And then international next year. Awesome. Um, what did you learn from the tour that will make things better for the next time you guys go out? We need a booking agent because, you know, I had to do an awful lot of the work. A couple of people helped, but it, it took me like four months of around the clock getting this one month tour together. Um, we need a tour manager because I was also doing that and, and you know, um, settling the nights, doing the accounting and all of that stuff, which I, you know, I don't want to do again. Um, <laughs> so yeah, we're, we're right now, uh, we are booking shows anyway, because we've had so many people offer, but I am actively looking for a, a, a serious agent to take us on and sign us and take that out of my hands. And then next time out, more than likely the extra person we'll bring with us will be a tour manager who wears a secondary hat, but somebody that can you know, deal with that. After the show, when everybody's going to the merch counter to meet fans and sign, you know, I'm sitting down with the venue owner getting paid and going through this, that, and the other thing. And I'm happy to keep my eyes on everything, but I, 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 I don't mind wearing two hats, but this time around I had like five on and, and it was too much. It's, I don't want to do that again. Yeah. I don't blame you. Yeah. Uh, any hints on what, uh, what some of these new songs are that you guys are going to work out? Um, Sure. Uh, I have just put together a, a very, very cool lamb medley. Oh, nice. Yep. And it's pretty serious. It's, you know, I got to tell you when, I don't know if you remember the medleys and, and, but they all work with like metric modulations and it just becomes magic when I put these things together. So, you know, I, I've got, um, you know, Xanadu. And then that goes into close to the heart. And it literally goes from either eighth note to eighth note or eighth note to dotted eighth so that the triplet becomes the new eighth note. And, and, and like the Bruford medley was insane. Um, <laughs> you know, those five tunes that I put together should not be played that smooth and evenly, but it all worked out. So I've got this lamb medley that I just put together a couple of days ago. And it's just crazy how one works into the next you know, seamless, um, long distance run around. Wow. That's do fantastic. That one. Yeah. I can't wait to do that. Just the same. Ah, so nice. yeah. Yeah. So good. So yeah. good. So those are, the, those are three of, of four or five that we're going to be working up. Yeah. All right. Well, you can find project. You've got, uh, you've got the website. Um, just Google it. You'll find it. I forget yeah. what it is. <laughs> projectband.com no, 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 project p-r-o-g-j-e-c-t.com dot com okay and the same thing i think it might be project band on facebook and project on twitter and instagram i'm i'm not that much into the social media <laughs> side of it but yeah. if you search project you'll see the logo and yeah. you can find us on all of those formats great jonathan mover thank you so much for your time really had a great time seeing you guys perform this music live uh had a great time talking to you about it and uh would love to revisit sometime down the line with you likewise i mean i appreciate the invitation and, and you know i can certainly relate to everything that you're talking about because i love the prog stuff just like you do and and you know let's keep in touch and maybe we can follow up again before the next tour and give some insight into what we're going to be playing and where we're going to be playing it sounds great